hearts as we look through this and and that father that you will you will sink your truths deep in our heart and may you be glorified in jesus name amen okay tonight we're in ezra ezra and um we're going to go through some of this like we normally do all this kind of stuff and then we're going to lay out some stuff and i uh, think it can be interesting and then we're going to get into something that uh um, if you've read Ezra before, you know where I'm going to go with it. And, um, but if you haven't, it's, uh, it, can be, it has been a very controversial section in, uh, in Christendom. All right, so let's go f first. All right, the title. Tech is, in Hebrew, technically the name Ezra is an Aramaic form of, of the Hebrew, which probably most likely means Jehovah helps. The name Ezra represents the historical significance of the times. Okay, why? Because remember, we're right about, right about in here. We're in the exile, okay, where Ezra was. And they were, uh, you know, we saw that uh, the kingdom split, went into north and south. In 722, Assyria came in and obliterated the northern kingdom. Okay, there was nothing left of it. And then later on, around 586, the, uh, or really we're going to see tonight between 605 and 586, you know, Babylon came down and captured the southern kingdom, which is Judah, which is basically around two tribes or so, and took them into captivity. So the name of the book, you know, the name Ezra, which is the name of, of, of we're going to see one of the prophets, okay, actually he's a priest, not really a prophet, but he was a priest, but he did hear from God, some say he's a prophet, I think he was. All right. Hey, tell the Lord to hold on a second. Okay. All right, the author. Now, we don't know. It doesn't say that Ezra wrote this book. All right. But let me show you a couple things. Ezra has long been viewed as the author of the book of Ezra. The similarity between, as we saw last week, the last two verses of Second Chronicles and the first several verses, first three verses of Ezra go together. Okay, which gives us a possible clue to the authorship of both of the books. And I told you last week, I believe that, that Chronicles was written by Ezra, and I believe that Ezra was written by Ezra, and we're going to see why. The book of Ezra begins with a continued chronicle of God's people in exile. Okay, Persia had just defeated Babylon and has become the new world power. Babylon came in here, Persia came in later on and attacked and took over and wiped out, you know, the... the government and the structure of Babylon and put its own uh, structure in. So we'll get into that a little bit in a minute. So <clears throat> Ezra's name does not occur until the seventh chapter of Ezra. It is there that the writer, it's interesting, the writer is writing in the third person all the way to the seventh chapter and then the seventh chapter switches and it goes to the first person. So that's why many believe and also because of Chronicles that Ezra was and is the author. Now, who is Ezra? Let's look real quick. Turn to chapter 7 of Ezra. Let's look just like a couple of verses. Now, after these things, verse 1 of chapter 7 in Ezra. Now, after these things, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, there went up Ezra, son of Shariah, son of Azariah, son of Hilkiah, son of, okay, we'll forget all the sons. All right, verse 5, son of Abishua, son of Phinehas, son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, the chief priest. This Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses, which the Lord of God of Israel had given. And the king granted him all, the requested, uh, all that he requested because the hand of the Lord, his God, was upon him. So what do we learn about Ezra there? What is he? In the line of Aaron, what else? He's a scribe, which he was an expert in the law. In many ways, we call him a lawyer you know, today. So as a scribe, Ezra was allowed, and this is interesting. Look with me real quick. These are things that, that many times we'll, we'll miss because we go through certain things and we just kind of not think of what's going on. Look at chapter 1 of Ezra. Let's look at verse 1. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, 
in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout all of his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, thus says, and wait a minute, stop. What did it say that King Cyrus did? Proclamation. But what did, what did he do? What does it say? He put it in writing. You're going, what does that mean? Let me show you something else. It's interesting. Turn to chapter 4. And look at verse 9. Now let's look at verse 8. Raham, the commander, Shimshai, the, the scribe, wrote a letter against Jerusalem to King Artaxerxes as follows. Then, uh, then wrote Raham, the commander of Shemesiah, the scribe of the rest of the colleagues, the judges, it goes on. It says that they wrote something, right? There's, there's a, a number of places in the book of Ezra, like in chapter 9, verses, uh, chapter 4, verse 9 through 22, chapter 5, verses 7 through 17, chapter 6, verses 3 through 12, and also uh, chapter 7, verse 10, and in Nehemiah, chapters 8, verses 1 through 9, and chapter 12, verse 36, it all talks about documents. It says, and they wrote, and they wrote, and they wrote. How would Ezra know this? Well, this. As a scribe, evidently, he had access to the administrative documents in the royal archives of the Persian Empire. Now, normally, we wouldn't think about that, but... Ezra had to, have some under, had to have some type of way of getting these documents so that he could put these things in this book that he was writing. So he had some type of favor alongside with Cyrus and others where he, as a scribe that he can get into and get these documents and see what was going on to put the pieces of the puzzle together as he's writing this. Isn't that pretty cool? I thought it was really neat. The most logical conclusion is that Ezra authored this book along with Chronicles, and we're going to see possibly even Nehemiah another time. Now, let me show you some dates. Date, possibly written between 457 and 444 B.C., but it's interesting because the first date, 457, represents Ezra's coming to Jerusalem from Persia. You can see that in Ezra chapter 7, verse, chapter 7 through chapter 10, and the second date around this time, 444 B.C., Okay, represents Nehemiah's arrival in Jerusalem. And we're going to see what all that means in just a moment. And as a side note, I'm going to give you this just out of one of those factoids. If you like factoids, this is interesting. As a side note, and to help place these events in history, the contemporaries of Ezra and Nehemiah were this. Gautama Buddha in India during this time he lived. Confucius in China lived during his time, and Socrates in Greece lived during his time. Isn't that interesting? Hmm? Mm -hmm. I believe so. Mm -hmm. Isaiah, Isaiah. <laughs> he was coexisting, wasn't he? <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> he just covered all of his bases, so if one of them's right, I'm going there, all right? <laughs> Here's some key people in Ezra. Ezra himself, he was a scribe, a teacher of God's word who began religious reform among the people. He led the second group of exiles from Babylon to Jerusalem, which we'll see in a moment. And we have Cyrus, Persian king who conquered Babylon, assisted the return of the Israelite exiles to their homeland, Ezra chapter 1 all the way through chapter 6. Zerubbabel, who led the first group of Israelite exiles from Babylon to Jerusalem, and he completed the rebuilding of the temple in Ezra chapter 2 through chapter 5. Haggai, post-exilic after the exile, prophet who encouraged Zerubbabel and the Israelite people to continue rebuilding the temple, Ezra chapter 5 through Ezra chapter 6. Zechariah, another prophet during the time after the exile, who encouraged Zerubbabel and the Israelites, okay, people to continue again rebuilding. 
Darius, who was a Persian king who supported the rebuilding of the temple by the Israelites in Ezra chapter 4, verse, uh, verse 5 through chapter 6, verse 14. And then Artaxerxes, the Persian king who allowed Ezra to return to Jerusalem and reinstitute temp- so he could reinstitute temple worship and the teaching of the law. Now, there's some background things that we got to look at. Any, we okay so far? Okay. The events in the life of the people of Israel must be understood in the light of God's plan for them. Now, we're going to see a little bit about this in a moment. But understand this. This whole purpose that we're going to see in a moment is that Ezra is writing to let the people know who they were, where they're at, and where God wants to take them. It's a really interesting little book. It's only, what, 10 chapters, but it's packed full of all kinds of stuff in there. So to understand all of this, we have to understand where the people came from, where and what is God's plan for them. He chose them in Abraham. He gave them a land. He brought Israel out of slavery in Egypt. Hundreds of years later, still before Ezra, God warned his people that if they chose to break their covenant with him, this is in Jeremiah, he would again allow another nation to take them into slavery. God's repeated warnings were persistently ignored. Immorality, idolatry were the national pastimes, if you really think about it, as you look through the history of Israel. God was faithful and followed through on his warnings. In 722, as we saw right here, he allowed Assyria to come in and defeat and deport all ten tribes and scatter them all over the empire. Decades later, around 605 through 586, right here we're going to see what all that means, God allowed the Babylonians to destroy and depopulate Jerusalem. God chastened his people, you know, what was left of the people was 70 years of exile in Babylon. And in around 536 to 539 B.C., Cyrus, the Persian king, overthrew Babylon. A year later, as recorded by Ezra, Cyrus permitted the return of the Jews to Jerusalem. Now, let me show you something It's really interesting. We think of 586, but really this, cap, this, this, this battle, this overtaking, started in 605. And during this time here, there were three deportations from the, the southern kingdom to Babylon in 605 and 597, and then in the final one in 586. So it took them approximately around 19 years to conquer Jerusalem. Isn't that interesting? To depopulate, but they conquered it, but they had to depopulate it too. Okay, so you're right. That's probably a better way of saying it. Hmm? I don't know which one they were in, but they, yeah, they may have gone in the first one. And we probably will see that as we go along. And then what's interesting is that then there were three returns. Zerubbabel led the first one in five, around 538 B.C., back to Jerusalem. Ezra, in 458 B.C., led the second one when they were returned, and then Nehemiah in 445 B.C. And over this time, there was, almost, there was around 90 to 93 years of returning. That was, that's, almost, that's over two generations, a generation being 40 years. Yeah, it's really interesting. And again, from here to the first return, it was approximately 67 to 70 years. So that's what the, the captivity was. Isn't that interesting? And then you see a little bit of a timeline. The theme of this whole book is God's grace brings spiritual restoration. This is just several, several uh, commentators' view of what it says. And it was, let me tell you something else. Jerusalem and the temple were eventually rebuilt during this time here. But the sad part about it, even in Jewish history, and you look through it, even Josephus said it was nowhere near the glory of what they had because they couldn't stay away from the idols. They were constantly forgetting where they came from. And I think in some ways that's a, you know, 
that's something that believers, this is just a side note, that believers need to understand too. It is good to remember where we came from, what we were like before Christ, and what we should be after that. Because if we were really saved, and God changed our lives, and God saved us, and we understand that, we need to remember, that's who I was. It's not who I am, that's who I was. And look what God has done. God took them, he's constantly reminding Israel all through the scriptures, even all the way into Malachi, and even into the New Testament, that he was a God who took them out of Egypt, set them up, gave them a land, gave them a kingdom. He didn't want to give them a king, but they wanted and he still gave them a king. And he blessed them, and he blessed them, and they still kept going back. And this is, you know, we say, oh, I can't believe it. If I was Israel, I would have never done it. We do it every day. Anytime we disobey, we're serving an idol, whatever that idol is. If it's, if it's lying, if it's food, if it's whatever it might be, whatever sin that we may commit, we're serving that sin in some way. We said, that's more important than my relationship with God. But in this, we see the grace of God, just like with, with Israel. God still took care of them. God chastised them. God rebuked them. God disciplined them. But he always kept bringing them back. And all for what we're going to see as we cross over from Malachi to Matthew when we finally get there, okay, we're going to see what happened, what the whole purpose of all this was, why he kept taking care of them. We all know. We know it's for Christ. We all know that. But it's really interesting when we start seeing the line because we've seen it so far, how he's protecting the line, the lineage of David. It, northern got scattered. The southern kingdom was always protected. That line of David was always protected so that we could have what we have. And that's so cool to me. I mean, I could stop right there, go home, and be happy, okay? But I'm going to bore you some more. Here we go. So the theme is a continual grace which God showered on his people. And you know what's interesting? What was one of those graces, if you think about it? Okay? We have the deportations. 70 years or so, they're in captivity. What was the grace that God brought? You know what it was? The favor to get them to go back. He granted them favor with the king of Persia. He granted them favor with those in leadership. And they said, no, go on back. I mean, so much favor that if you read this, and we'll see in Nehemiah, that they gave them all kinds of stuff to go do it. <laughs> Just great. Imagine you're in your job and they, and the, and they say, listen, you know, you know, you need to go, you need to go back to your homeland. And we, the company, we're going to provide all that you need financially to take you there and to get you all set up just because we like you. How many of us would want to see that happen in our job, right? Listen, you don't need to work anymore. You need to go and just take care of your family. Build your house. Get your land going. You know, you know get a new car, and we're going to provide all that for you just because we like you. And that's exactly what it was. It was a favor of God. Why? So that they could restore his people. I mean, that, that's amazing. Now, the purpose of the writing, real quick. Ezra writes this book to chronicle, as I told you before, the history of Israel, okay? But it's interesting. It's after the exile. There's a little bit in there before, but it's after the exile. He chronicles that history, how Israel returned from the exile to, uh, in Babylon and Persia, how they returned, how Jerusalem was transformed from a heap of rubble into a city, okay? We see in the time of Jesus how the temple went from being devastated to being rebuilt and expanded in the time of, of Herod the Great. And the second thing, Ezra also writes, for the purpose of recording, now this is the sad part, the moral and spiritual decline of the people and the consequent revival that God wrought through his own ministry as well as with Haggai and Zechariah because the revival was what? Turning the people back to God, which we're going to see in just a moment. Now, another quick thing, and then we're going to be looking at two chapters specifically. Christ in the book of Ezra. Well, it's this. The Davidic line, and also in that line, the promise of God's grace to provide and to restore, because that's what Christ was all about. 
He restored us back to our relationship with God. And we see that. The whole point of this, and we're going to see in a moment, is especially with Ezra, is that Ezra brings the people back to focus on God because they weren't focusing on him at all. They're bringing him back, bringing him back into a relationship with him. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Years of silence. Oh, there were. There were many people. Mm -hmm. We will get to that, but it's going to be later on down the line. You know, I can't get into it tonight. No. No, we aren't even touching that yet. But to tell you real quick, where it says these, those years of silence, there was about 400 years there of silence. What that means is that there was no word from the Lord. There was no prophet. There was none of that. Okay, there was no, God, quote, wasn't speaking to his people through the prophet or anything else, which is, because why? I'll tell you this, I'll give you a head start on it. No, teaching the words one thing, but no prophets were speaking during that time. It was that's why they call it the silence. There was nothing going on during those times where there was a prophet saying, an actual prophet of the Lord that was recorded saying, This is what God's saying. It was those those years. Because the next voice that they heard, because if you really oh man, now you got me thinking about it. Okay. Turn turn to turn to Malachi real quick. I'm gonna show you this. I'm gonna take one side note. Mary, it's your fault, okay? <laughs> Let me show, show you something. Mm -hmm. It does. Mm -hmm. Look at the last two verses of Malachi. We've read these many times. It says, But hold, I am going to send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. And then what do we see later on in Matthew? When you look at Matthew, John the Baptist, what did Jesus say, who, who he was? He was? He came in the spirit of Elijah. So which was that? So that, this, is, this is what we gotta understand. Golly, I'm gonna stop, stop, Ron. Um, <laughs> is that Elijah was the last Old Testament prophet. He was the final, it was over with him. He was the last what they call an Old Testament prophet because he came in the spirit of Elijah because he had... John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Did I say, what did I say? Elijah. Elijah. I'm sorry, John the Baptist because I was thinking of Elijah and John the Baptist. It's my fault. John the Baptist was the last Old Testament prophet. It was it. And so he was the closing of what, what we see here in the beginning because he introduced the Messiah, which was, takes all of this and puts it all together in one person which is Christ himself. He was the purpose of all of this, all keeping this pure all the way through, no matter what, so that we could have Christ. He had to come that way. And that's the cool part about it, because I'm getting sparked going through this with you guys, because I haven't done this in years. you know. And I'm going, wow, I've forgotten this. I for and it's just so cool how God kept that thread going. Until John the Baptist says, behold, the Lamb of God. And when he said that, and he put him under, it was shortly after that, what did John say? He must increase, and I must decrease. What about it? They weren't looking for that. The... What Ezra is talking about, and we'll see in a second, even more, is that they kept taking their eyes off of God Himself, off of Jehovah. As soon as they needed Him, they they would run to Him. But as soon as things got okay and things looked good, 
they started swaying this way, started swaying this way, and it was constantly pulling them back over and over and over and over and over and over again. I'm your king. I'm your God. I'm the one that did this for you. Why, you know, why are you going away? You're my bride. You're my child. You're my, all these metaphors they would use, all these analogies of bride and children and, 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 and my people and, you know, and on and on and on, and they were constantly going away from him. And they were running to other gods. They did it all the time. It's the same thing that most believers do. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to pull the reins in on this one, because <laughs> if, if I don't, we're going we're gonna to chase this rabbit all over the place. Okay, let me show you a couple of things. There were several stages of, of the temple construction. When they came back, and we're going to see more about that when we look in Nehemiah, okay, that there were several stages, there was actually four of them. They laid the foundation, and you see that in Ezra chapter 3, okay? They, they had an interruption in Ezra chapter 4. We're going to see more about that, not tonight, but tomorrow, you know, next week. And then in, in Ezra chapter 5 through Ezra, the middle of chapter 6, the completion of the temple. And then in uh, Ezra, Ezra chapter 6, the last half of it, you see the celebration, which is a Passover time, of the completion of the temple. Now, Ezra has his place in the scriptures in this way. Historically, Ezra captures part of the record of the return to Jerusalem. The rest of the record is in Nehemiah, which we're going to look at next week. So historically, that's where Ezra, Ezra sits in the scriptures. Theologically, Ezra emphasizes both the sovereign grace of God and providing for his people an extremely important place that the law deserved in Israel's life. That's part of your question, because they would sway from the law. God said, do it this way, and they were constantly swaying from it and moving from it, and doing it their way. It's the same with us. If God's word says this, we try to reinterpret it. Why? For our benefit. You know, that's why a lot of times I say, if it says this, do that. You know, don't. And that's exactly what was happening right here in the three returns. Because you're going to see what was happening. Because by the time Ezra showed up there, in this time, between here, all kinds of stuff was going on. And that's where we're going to be in, in Ezra chapter 9 in just a second. Because they just didn't do what the Word of God said. And most of the time, mostly because they kept forgetting it. Now, de uh, devotionally, where is it said? Ezra reminds us to obey the commands of our Lord recorded in the Scripture and to trust Him to work out all the details. Now, here we go. Ezra chapter 9. Let's look at it. I'll do my best to read it without stuttering. Now, when these things have been completed, the princes approached me saying, the people of Israel and the priests, which is very important, and the Levites, very important, have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands. According to their abominations, those of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jezebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy race, catch this, has intermingled with the peoples of the lands. Indeed, the hands of the prince and the rulers have been foremost in this unfaithfulness. When I heard this matter... I tore my garment, garment and my robe and pulled some of the hair from my head and from my beard and sat down appalled. Then everyone who trembled at the words of the God of Israel on account of the unfaithfulness of the exiles gathered to me, and I sat appalled until the evening offering. But at the evening offering, I arose from my humiliation, even with my garment and my robe torn, and I fell on my knees and stretched my hands out, uh, my, out my hands to the Lord my God, and I said, O oh my God, I am ashamed and embarrassed to lift up my face to you. My God, for our iniquities have risen above our heads, and our guilt has grown even to the heavens. 
Since the days of our fathers to this day, we have been in great guilt. And on account of our iniquities, we, our kings and our priests, have been given into the hand of the kings of the lands to, to the sword, to, the captiv to captivity, to plunder, and to open shame as it is this day. But now, for a brief moment, I catch this, but now for a brief moment, grace has been shown from the Lord our God to leave us an escaped remnant and to give us a peg in his holy place that our God may enlighten our eyes and grant us a little reviving in our bondage. Isn't that pretty cool what he just said? You know what he said? God's given us a revival. For we are slaves, yet in our bondage our God has not forsaken us, but, ha but has extended loving kindness to us in the sight of the kings of Persia and to give us reviving to raise up the house of our God to restore its ruins and to give us a wall in Jer Judah and Jerusalem. Now, our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken your commandments. Here we go. Which you have commanded by your servants, the prophets, saying, the land which you are entering to possess is an unclean land, and the uncleanness of the peoples of the lands with our, um, wait a minute, entering uncleanness of the peoples of our lands with their abominations which have filled it from end to end and with their iniquity. So now do not give your daughters to their sons, nor take their daughters to your sons, and never seek their peace or their prosperity, that you may be strong and eat the good things of the land and leave it as an inheritance to your sons forever. After all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and our uh, great guilt, since you, our God, have requited us less than, less than our iniquities deserved and have given us an given us an escaped remnant as this. Shall we again break your commandments and intermarry with the peoples who commit these abominations? Would you not be angry with us to the point of destruction until there is no remnant nor any who escape? O Lord God of Israel, you are righteous, for we have been left an escaped remnant as it, as it is this day. Behold, we are before you in our guilt, for no one can stand before you because of this. Now, while Ezra was praying and making confession, weeping and prostrating himself before the house of God, a very large assembly, men, women, and children, gathered to him from Israel, for the people wept bitterly. Shechaniah, the son of Jehiel, one of the sons of Elam, said to Ezra, We have been unfaithful to our God and have married foreign women from the peoples of the land. Yet now there is hope for Israel in spite of this. So now let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the wives and your children according to the counsel of my Lord, which he's talking to Ezra, and of those who tremble at the commandment of our God, and let it be done according to the law. Arise, for this matter is your responsibility, but we will be with you. Be courageous and act. That's what he's telling Ezra. Then Ezra rose and made the, uh, made the leading priests, the Levites, and all Israel take an oath that they would do according to the, this proposal, so they took the oath. Then Ezra rose from the, before the house of God and went into the chamber of Jehel, Jehohana, the son of Elishib. Although he went there, he did not eat bread nor drink water, for he was mourning over the unfaithfulness of the exiles. They made a proclamation throughout Judah and Jerusalem to all the exiles that they should assemble at Jerusalem. And that whoever would not come with within three days, according to the counsel of the leaders and the elders, all his possessions should be forfeited and he himself excluded from the assembly of the exiles. So all the men of Judah and Benjamin assembled at Jerusalem within three days. It was the ninth month on the 20th of the month, and all the people sat in an open square before the house of God, trembling because of this matter and the heavy rain. They were sitting in rain pouring down. Then Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, You have been unfaithful and have married foreign wives, adding to the guilt of Israel. Now therefore, make confession to the Lord God of your fathers and do his will, and separate yourselves from the peoples of the land and from the foreign wives. Then all the assembly replied with a loud voice, That's right, as you have said, so it is our duty to do. But there are many people, and it is a rainy season, and we are not able to stand in the open. Nor can the task be done in one or two days, for we have transgressed greatly in this matter. Let our leaders represent the whole assembly and let all those in our cities 
who have married foreign wives come at appointed times together with the elders and judges of each city until the fierce anger of our God on account of this matter is turned away from us. Only Jonathan, the son of Ashahel, and Jaziah, the son of Tikva, oppose this. And Meshulam and Shabbatiah, the Levites, supported them. But the exiles did so. And Ezra the priest selected men who were heads of the family, fathers, households of each of their father's households, all of them by name, so they con convened on the first day of the tenth month to investigate the matter. They finished investigating all the men who had married foreign wives by the first day of the first month. Then it goes on. What do you think so far? How does that sit today? Here's the scene. Ezra arrives in Jerusalem. He's told of the problem in chapter 9. Ezra reacts to the news, as we saw, tore his clothes, tore his beard, pulled hair out of his head and his face, and sat and prayed. Ezra seeks God's and intercedes for the people. While Ezra prays, the crowd gathers, and Shechaniah proposes a solution and encourages Ezra to act upon it. Ezra agrees, and the people agreed to the proposal, Ezra sets up, basically sets up committees, and the process begins. He's telling the guys that they married foreign women, and so they have to divorce those women and take the women and the children and send them off. Is that the one you gave me? Yeah, that's this right here. Yeah, and I saw your little note, Mary. <laughs> mm -hmm. It was an interesting read. Very interesting. You want to summarize it? What, what he said? The Mosaic Law, 
prohibits the, uh, the intermarriage with the people of, of that land. They didn't, okay, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 3 and 4, also Exodus chapter 34, verses 11 through 17, and we can read, you can read those if you want on your own. Right. You have Moses' wife. You have Ruth. Um, who else? Huh? Rahab. Yeah, Rahab. Mm -hmm. So there's three prominent ones right there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, actually, it's both. But the, the prominent part, we're going to see in a second, because I've got about eight or nine things here that we're going to look at, you know, according to this, because this is real controversial. And I'm not going to tell you, you know, that you're going to probably agree with what I say when we get done, okay? But it's, it's prominently more of the disobedience to the Word of God, what God said, but it has that in there because the whole point of it, remember we saw that, you know, the last couple of books we've looked at, God's real concerned and real, got his eye on the DNA, okay? Because why? It's taking that line, that line of David has got to be kept all the way through. So it's both, but predominantly it's not as much of the, the how would you say, the, uh, the DNA as it is just you broke my command. But what was the command for? To keep the people pure all the way through. But see, that's freaky if you really think about it because that sounds like a, uh, uh, you know, what, what, you know um, white supremacy, okay? If you really think about it. I've heard people say that. I, God's in the, you know, the supremacy. Look what, you know, no, no, no. But people think that. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And I don't mean pure like, you know, you know like you keep a, uh, uh, canines, you know, and they get papers. But just the fact of keeping that line of David going as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Because, mm -hmm. but remember, this right here, they were so, they got so assimilated into the other nations that they were lost. Okay? You have the two tribes down here, Benjamin and you have Judah, that really kind of carried forward at least into the, the time of Christ. Mm -hmm. You're getting in my notes. <laughs> That's good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Give me. Give me a second. Let, let me go through a couple of these because you're 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 on track. Okay. Now again, the 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 commands of God were explicit. Okay, can you turn this down just a little bit, darling, for me? Because it's really, because I'm starting to get excited. My voice is going up. I'm going to blow eardrums. God commanded way before this happened not to do something. And this is one of the reasons, one of the reasons why all this started happening. And especially right in here, okay, and then right down here. And you'll see as you, as you go along, you know, when we get into Nehemiah and some of the others, that they refer back to Solomon and they're almost blaming him, okay? Because he was the one that really started bringing this in. It was there, but he really started bringing this. But again, it's not just the intermarrying. 
It's the fact of going after idols, the idols, the idols, the false gods getting in. Now, the second thing, first, the law was very explicit on what to do and what not to do, who to marry and what not to marry. Second thing, marriage in Israel involved a covenant before God, which is very, very, very sacred. Let me show you something. Turn with me to good old Malachi, that verse that we all probably know, where it says God hates divorce, right? Let's look at something. Chapter 2 of Malachi. Let's look at starting verse 13. It says, this is another thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, which means the priests are weeping. Look what it says, with weeping and with groaning because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. Yet you say, verse 14, for what reason? They're saying, God, why aren't you hearing us? Why aren't you answering, answering us? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth against whom you have dealt treacherously, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Now catch that, by covenant. But not one has done so who has a remnant of the Spirit. And what did, uh, what did that one do while he was seeking a godly offspring? Take heed to, then to, the, uh, to your spirit and let no one treacherous, deal treacherously against the wife of your youth. For I hate divorce, which means this. What were they doing? The priest and others were divorcing their wives for any old reason that they wanted. Now these, now these are, you know, Israelite women. These are godly women. These are not what we're talking about here. We don't know that, but, okay, we don't know that. But, okay, we can kind of put that way in there. But, but what was going on was this, is that if, you know, I don't have the actual, you know, references, but if you look in the, the oral law, you look in some of the interpretations of the law, they were giving them, I mean, I'm going to paraphrase it this way. If your wife burnt the toast over and over again and you didn't like it, you could divorce her and be okay. And that was considered dealing treacherously with their wives. But the point I wanted to make here is that marriage, especially in Israel, and it, it should be in Christians also, that it was not just a, a contract, it was a covenant. But it wasn't just a covenant with like Denise and I, that's part of it, but it was a covenant with God. It was a covenant with God. So marriage was just not just the establishment of homes and families, it was understood as a covenant with God. The Jews were called in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 13, a holy seed. They were called a holy people in Isaiah 62, verse 12. We have been called a holy nation, a people belonging to God, because we have been grafted into those very promises and that covenant with God. So we are part of him. And so historically, it was considered a covenant before God. Let me get to the third one here. The historical occasion prompted Ezra's decision to do this. It is a critical time in the reestablishment of the Jewish people in their homeland. They're back. This is during this time right here that we're looking at. Ezra comes back, and he gets this report after he gets back that all these foreign women have been married to all these priests, all these rulers, all these, these leaders, and many other people. And it just breaks his heart because what's happening is that these two lines that God preserved and sent home, He's saying they're going to get lost. They're going to get lost and they're going to happen because if you really look at it, this is the fear. Because they got scattered into the nations. But this line is still going. So it's a critical time in the establishment of that in their, in their homeland. In the years before Ezra arrived, years before Ezra arrived in Persia, many of the returned Jewish men intermarried with pagan women from the area. Listen at pagan women. Ezra understood the reason for the Babylonian captivity and desired to put an end to the practices that drove God to discipline his people. That was Ezra chapter 9, verses 10 through 15. Look at it real quick. Here's one of the reasons that he's about to do what he's going to do, or he agrees to it. Look at verse 10. Now, our God, what shall we say to this? For we have forsaken your commandments. There's a reason which you have commanded by your servants the prophets, saying, the land which you are entering to possess is an unclean land, and the uncleanness 
of the peoples of the lands with their abominations which have, been fi which have filled it from end to end and with their impurity. So now do not give your daughters to their sons nor take their wives. He's quoting and paraphrasing what God said in the law because he knew the law. So the fourth thing is Ezra's concern was primarily about following God. Again, we just read that, Ezra chapter 9, verses 10 through 15. Ezra believed that his people belonged to Jehovah and that their intermarriage with the other nations was, breaking, was a breaking of the bond and rebellion against Jehovah's commands. Am I, are you all tracking with me so far? Fifth thing, leaders were involved in the intermarriage. The problem was presented with a report of the priests and Levites at the forefront of this rebellion, Ezra chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. They were at the forefront. They were the ones that were doing this and were leading the way. And what was the leader? It's like, like me. You, you see me, you know, one day you're going somewhere and you see my truck parked in front of a bar and I'm stumbling out. Okay? Which you will never see because I can't stand liquor anyways. Okay? You know, and I'm stumbling out. What is that going to say to everybody else? Oh, it's good. I'll, I'll give you a prime example. I won't tell you the ministry, but there was a ministry that we were with a long time ago. And after the, uh, after the, the worship service and after the conference, a lot of the men and some of the women would go and get wine and beer and cigars and stuff, and they'd go up and they would trash. It was like rock stars, and they would trash a hotel room. Okay, they would get drunk, and they would stumble out. In fact, to the point where, they were, you know, the, the, the maids that would come in, they would bring out garbage bags of cans and bottles. And what happened was, is that that kind of attitude sir, is, has spread through that ministry that it's okay to get schnockered, you know? This is what's going on here. I mean, that's a mi minor thing, but that's what's happening. The leaders were leading the way, so what was happening is the, the, the remnant that returned are going, this is okay, we can do this. Priests are doing it. The Levites are doing it. We can do this. It's okay. God must be okay with it if the spiritual ones are doing it. <laughs> so it then seems that the prominent offenders, again, were the priests and the Levites. These individuals were the, to be the example to the people in following God and his commandments. Sixth thing, this is not about interracial marriage, but about interfaith marriage. There's a big difference in that. My wife and I, I, I'm in an interracial marriage. I married a Latin, a Puerto Rican lady, full blood Puerto Rican. Okay, praise God. All right, but that's an interracial marriage, yes. The seed was not just in, as I call the DNA, which is, is part of it, okay, but it's not the extreme. The seed is the following of God, having that, carrying that over, because we're going to see, well, I don't want to jump ahead. Rahab. Ruth. We must not emphasize, we must emphasize that the sinfulness of these marriages does not lie primarily in their being to Gentiles, but in their being to unregenerated Gentiles in the faith. The Old Testament had numerous references to Gentiles amongst the uh, people of God who are honored as a result of their conversion to worship Jehovah, which is what? Esther, Rahab, see? They, were, they all came that way. Now, all right. Again, this is not the forbidding of interracial marriage, but of interfaith marriage. John MacArthur said this was very good. This is one of the few quotes I got in here. It does not establish a norm about divorce, what they're doing here. It is also easy to overlook the fact that while the solution of divorce was a group decision, didn't we see that? It was a group decision. Each of these marriages was probably examined individually. Okay? Presumably, cases in which the women have become believers were treated differently than cases in which the women involved saw questions of faith as a violation of the marriage agreement. So 
what is he saying? Most likely, from what we can understand, because there was that two-month period where they were thinking this thing through, that they, were, they would evaluate each and every one. And why do I say that? Because if you look at the last part of chapter 10, it lays out all the priests, and they went through and saw all the people that did this. And, mo and it shows very clearly that they were not married to women that took on the Jewish faith. They were not proselyte. You know, does that make sense? So in this case, does it, does it justify in our minds still the fact that they sent these women and stuff on their way? Now let me hang on to that because there's, there's an interesting thing here. Ezra was a man who knew the law of God and lived by it. He understood the very principles as well as the spirit of it, as we have seen. His decision to stand with the proposal given for the divorcing of unbelieving wives for the sake of the covenant, of, covenant Israel had with God was right according to the letter and the spirit of the law given. Malachi 2.16 says that God hates divorce. Also, Matthew chapter 19, verses 1 through 12, Jesus said, What God has joined together, let no man separate, right? From the beginning, divorce was never God's intention. In our hardness of heart, God has permitted divorce, Matthew chapter 19, for only two reasons, unfaithfulness, and then in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the leaving of an unbelieving spouse. But see, if Jesus said Moses gave us divorce and God allowed it because of our hardness of heart, what do you think this is happening? What's going on here? It's an allow it's allotment. Does God hate divorce? Yes. But this is an allotment because of the hardness of heart and because of the sinfulness of what happened. That makes sense? It's the same principle as in Matthew chapter 19. And then we have that allotment too in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, where it says. And it talks about both male and female, but it uses more the, the, the male to female, which means if, if, if a husband has an unbelieving wife and she doesn't want to stay with him any longer, it says let her go. It's okay. But if she wants to stay, then let her stay and don't divorce her. And I th really believe, I really believe, if my God, which I know he is, is the same God from Genesis to Revelation, what happened in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, I believe was going on here during those two months when they were looking at all this and putting it all together, and I really believe they evaluated each one. Because why? It happened earlier, because they knew the history, especially Ezra. He knew about Rahab. He knew about Esther. He knew about Ruth. He knew about Moses' wife. He knew about these women and, and probably many more. And I don't think they sent him off unless they were unbelieving and they just were not going to go, then you need to go because we can't, we can't stay married like that. That makes sense? You guys are letting me do all the talking and you're sitting here going, okay, what do you think? What's that? <laughs> I can't hear you, sweetie. Yeah. Does it sound like it's any different than today? Yeah. They're reciting their interpretation of the laws. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I use burnt toast. They didn't have electric toasters back then, but it was to that extreme. You know, if you didn't like the way that she looked in the morning, ah, get rid of her. Get a, get a younger model. Yeah. Let me tell you something else, and we'll we'll be done. Jesus took. What happened here? What we see happening during this little time period right here, and what was so confusing, Jesus took it, and, and, and Matthew, as I said before, 
and he brought the standard higher. If the unbelieving spouse desires to stay, the believer must not divorce them, but live in such a way as to be a living witness. But if they desire to leave, they are to go. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 2, Peter talks about that. He was telling wives to be witnesses to their, to their unbelieving husbands. But if the unbelieving husband wants to go, let him go. But if they desire to stay, then you be a witness. And see, that to me, as I looked at it, that's to step up higher. Just like when we saw, you know, when we see many times about adultery. We look at what adultery is physically, but Jesus took it one step further. And he says, if you're looking at a woman lustfully with your eyes, you're committing adultery. That's the same thing. It was a higher standard. And this is a higher standard. We see this here. But now, he says, if they're an unbelieving spouse and they want to stay, then you be a witness to them. That's the higher road. So he took it up a notch. Hmm? Take what up? This? I, th I think it was a notch up from here, yeah. Because from what I understand, this is the only one in the scriptures that we see something like this happen. It may have happened and not been recorded, but this here is a prominent thing. And every time it comes up with divorce, and, and I say every time, every time I've ever taught on divorce in some way, this passage that we're reading always comes up. And you won't be couldn't believe how many men and women have taken it so far out of context that they say, fine, I don't have an unbelieving, I have an unbelieving husband or unbelieving wife, I'm going to divorce her. And they use it. I've heard people tell me that in counseling. I have, a, I have a right. God said it. He did it in Ezra. I can divorce her. No, that's not what that's talking about. What about First Peter? What about First Corinthians? But they don't want to hear that. We'll take it and we'll take it to use it to our own benefit. So Jesus, yeah, I believe took it a step higher. So what you think? Give you something to think about? <laughs> What's there, Ann? You got that look on your face. What? Mm -hmm. There is. And you know what, I <laughs> just, I, I had these in, in my book. These are three completely different views of this. And you'll see them. And as I looked at it, and I think the script, I believe the scriptures back up what I just said, that this is what, it, this is what it's about. Hmm? 